I don't usually have my phone with me when I'm preaching. But this new Pokemon Go game is <laughs> pretty incredible. <laughs> Hang on just one second. All right, let's see if I can stay away from that for a few minutes. Um, this morning, the message is um, about time, actually, strange as that may seem. Um, if you are into Pokemon Go, you know that this is transforming the United States of America. I mean, it really is. I mean, it's just incredible what is happening um, with this, this whole Pokemon thing. And, and it's just amazing how much time is being spent, how many resources are being spent. And I have to laugh because as I look at the statistics about Pokemon Go, I see that with regard to Pokemon Go, there's actually some good things that are happening because of it. Um, I'm amazed, though, that during the time period from just June to July, uh, how this, this whole game has really expanded. Uh, it started off, there was about, the vast majority were teenagers who were playing it, but, but actually now, things have morphed into uh, a, a, just a general... I tell you what, the only people that aren't playing it are my age people, seriously. I mean, this, this is true. Uh, the millennials, the, uh, the, they're the biggest group that are playing, and so if you're in your early 30s, you probably are pretty much addicted to this right now. Uh, the interesting thing is that people over the age of 65, <clears throat> I'm not there yet, um, but you're playing it too, and uh, it is encompassing uh, tremendous amounts of people. There was a, a news show that was on TV, and they were out on the streets of New York City, and they were interviewing people that are playing the Pokemon game. And literally, people are walking past them, and they've got the cameras there, and they don't have time to talk to them. And they're asking people that they can finally capture, well, what do you think? You know, uh, how much time do you spend? One girl said, I just started playing three days ago. She says, I've played it about 30 to 40 hours. Another girl was standing there. She had an arm and a cast, and he said, did you get that playing Pokemon Go? And because people are walking into buildings, they're so focused on this, uh, and it's taking them, it, it's kind of the real live thing with these little Pokemon things, and you've got to, you know, gobble them up, and, and uh, it's, it's pretty intense. But stop and consider with me how the average player is spending two or more hours a day playing Pokemon Go than they did previously playing games. Two hours more than what they were previously playing. 16% of those surveyed play the game for more than four hours a day. Can you imagine? That's a serious time commitment that people are making. But as I mentioned, it's not all bad, although there are some things that are fairly negative. Over 10% say they have trespassed in order to catch one of those rascally Pokemons. Uh, 4% also said they'd been pulled over by the police while they were playing the game. The average amount, however, on a good side of weight loss is 3.2 pounds since they've started playing. It actually gets them outside. 44% of these trainers said that they'd visit a historical landmark uh, for the first time because they're playing this game. And get this one, this is my favorite. 24% of Pokemon players said that they visit, visited a religious institution for the first time. So it's got them into churches like ours. So if you see someone walking around with a, with a phone today, gobbling up Pokemons or whatever they do with these things, um, here in our auditorium, just count your blessings and hope they stay for the service, all right? 24%, that's getting them into church. Many of them are embarrassed, however, to tell their families or their bosses that they play Pokemon. And here's the scary one, up to 85% of trainers have played Pokemon Go while driving their car. Well, this morning we're going to talk about time. And if you have a need for a Bible, these fine gentlemen would love to put one in your hands. We are on a mini-series talking about multiplying your life. Last Sunday we looked at multiplying your life through uh, service, and we talked about the importance of serving the Lord, and we were in Second uh, or First Peter chapter four, and today we're talking about multiplying your life 
through redeeming the time. Multiplying your life through redeeming the time. When we think about time, it's um, amazing when you stop to consider uh, all of the aspects, but one of the things that stands out about time is that within the world and all its inequities, one thing that we all have in common is time. We all have the same amount of time in a given day, in a given week, and we have the opportunity to use that time as we see fit. And so this morning, we want to be able to look at multiplying the effectiveness of our Christian life through the good use of the time that God has blessed us with. So let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning, shall we? God, we just pray and thank you for the time that we can spend looking into your word. And Father, time is that watchword this morning that we'll be focused on. Teach us from your word, Lord. Help us to understand how we can be good stewards of all that you've given to us that we might be a blessing to you and glorify you in all that we say and do. We thank you, Father, for giving us this opportunity to join our hearts together. May the passages we look at this morning truly uh, affect our lives in a positive way. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. There is no question that in the world that we live in today, people are rushing here and there all the time. Without a doubt, we are one of the most busy societies that there's ever really been. Uh, we find ourselves humming to this and humming to that, and, and we are on the go all of the time. Uh, when you talk to people today, and the, the replies that you get when you say, how are you doing? Most people will say, oh, doing good. I'm, I'm really busy. And oftentimes I will say the same thing. The interesting thing is I was reading uh, some articles that were written about time management, especially applied to Christians, and they said that Christians are actually worse off than a lot of other people in society today when it comes to our busyness. It says, especially if you live in a big city, if you're part of the middle class, you have a managerial position or a professional position, because Christians, they said, tend to be more diligent than some other workers. They're very serious in their work. They want to do a good job. They want to glorify the Lord by the things that they do. They also, however, place a big value on family. And so they're trying to take the family responsibilities along with their professional responsibilities and try to balance all of them out. And then as well, they went on to note that oftentimes Christians are involved in their communities and also involved in their churches. And so with all of those extra dimensions, there just seems to be a crushing load of responsibility that falls on the shoulders of, of many Christian families today. No doubt the busyness of our schedule has affected the volunteerism that the church has thrived on over the centuries. People who have had time to devote to ministry and service for the Lord as oftentimes has been compromised. People don't have that time anymore. They find themselves exhausted. They find themselves uh, spent at the end of the week. And the last thing they want to think about is trying to put together some type of a lesson to teach children or teach adults. And so our schedules are just so compact and we find ourselves struggling to, to move through these these peaks and valleys of life and do it in an effective way. Well, one of the things that we look at when we stop to think about time is the scriptures. And we want to find out what does the Bible say? But as I go there to the scriptures this morning, I just want to point out to you today that the purpose of this message today is not to seek to dump more responsibilities on your already busy life. That is not my intention in any way, shape, or form. I'm not going to try to guilt you into anything this morning, but I am going to try to challenge you to take a look at your life and evaluate where the priorities are and where your time is being spent. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, and let's ask him to just bless our, our time uh, here as we have this, this opportunity. Father, again, we notice, Lord, that this is a a, a big issue in all of our lives. And Father, it's, it's sobering to stop and think about the ramifications of how we manage our time. I just pray, Lord, this morning that you'd especially bless us with wisdom. And I ask it in Christ's name, amen. Take your Bibles and go with me, if you would, to 
Psalm chapter 90. And as you're turning to Psalm chapter 90, let me just point out that the proposition that's in front of us is that we must use our allotted time with a better focus. That's the purpose of this message. By utilizing a biblical view of time that comes from understanding who we are as Christians, where we are today, and why we are here. And with all of that, we can manage time, and I believe manage time well. In Psalm chapter 90, uh, the psalmist is going to write, he's going to give us several things here that I believe are quite profound. In this passage of scripture, we start off, and the first point this morning is time, first of all, looking at time as a resource. Time is a resource. In chapter 90, we find that it says here, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. One thing we note about God right off the bat in chapter 90 is the fact that God is eternal. He's from everlasting to everlasting. There is no beginning with God. Try to wrap your head around that. Uh, I love the Sunday school lesson where it said, you know, it's like a circle. There's no beginning and no end. And it's like that's as deep as we ever really got. Because understanding that here I am as a finite individual with an end time and a beginning time, I realize that I'm quite a bit different than God. God is eternal in his aspect. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is present there when the mountains are born. He is there before the foundations of the earth. And you and I have to come to the grips with the fact that God is eternal and we are not. Although our bodies are not eternal, let me just point out that our soul is indeed eternal. But the Bible says that in verse 3, he says, you turn man back into dust. We have an end time. We have a beginning, we celebrate our birthdays, but we also have an end time. And so time is a resource that God has given to us. And it's a very unique resource when you stop and you think about time. Uh, as you think about time, it can't be accumulated like money can. You can save your money, you can accumulate things, you can accumulate raw materials, you can accumulate all kinds of things, but the interesting thing about time is that time is going by all of our days. It begins and it continues to flow and what we do with our time, we look back on and we say, this is what I did with my time or this is what I didn't do with my time. And so it's a very unique resource. We have it, it's there for us as long as we're here, as long as we're breathing. But understand this, that you can't pile up time for later. You can accumulate vacation days, you can accumulate vacation pay perhaps, but you can't accumulate hours and minutes. And so we look at Psalm chapter nine, 90 rather, and we say that God is eternal, but man's not. He's going to return to the dust. And in God says, return, O children of men. And this is where Peter gets his take on the time issue with God. He says, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as the watch in the night. The watch in the night happens, we're sleeping, the, the watchman's out there on the tower, and we don't even know that watchman was there for three or four hours, and then he left, and someone else came, because we were sound asleep. It passes by us, and it passes by readily. It seems like our days, according to verse 5, have been swept away. He says, you have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. This is the issue of man. And God says, it's, it's time. And, and man has a certain allotted amount of time. And it's, and it's here and it's gone. In fact, he even goes on and he says, in the morning, they're like grass, which sprouts anew. Ever been to Israel? You see, it's so rocky there. You have little plants that will actually spring up in the morning as the uh, morning sun comes out and they spring up and they look vibrant and they look great, but the strangest thing happens towards evening, they fade and wither. And what God is saying here is you may be in the morning time of your life or you may be in the evening time of your life. I think most of the kids over there in the nursery are in the morning time of their life. And some of us sitting here may be more in the evening and some of us may be more about lunchtime and that's where I think you think you are. I'm having lunch. I know I'm not just sprouting up this morning, but I'm having lunch and everything's great and it's, it's all wonderful. 
God says that when it comes to the end of our life, verse 9, we've finished our years like a sigh. That's it. And then he goes on and he begins to talk about the days of our lives in verse 10. For the days of our life, isn't days of our lives like a soap opera? Our lives are like soap operas, aren't they, in some ways? It's amazing. Your life comes, your life goes, and he says the days of our life, uh, they contain, he says, 70 years. So teach us, he says, verse 12, to number our days. Teach us to number our days so that, and the word so that gives us the purpose for numbering our days, that we may present to you He says, a heart of wisdom. Now that's huge, isn't it? It is true that God is eternal. We're not. There's an impact of sin that rests upon all of us. And for that reason, we don't live forever. This is the consequence of our sin. We're either a morning or a nighttime person. And at the most, he says, you can likely expect to live about 70 years. And so as we live life, the purpose of our living, teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Wisdom is seen in how we live our days. One day we're going to be face to face with the Lord. And this is what Psalm chapter 90 is trying to convey to us. This is reality. This is going to take place. Our days are going to be swept aside here on this earth. The wonderful thing is that our days are not done at that moment in time. But our time is just really beginning. And it's beginning throughout all of eternity, and it's going to be absolutely wonderful. But in the middle of that, we are going to meet God. There is going to be a time when we're meeting God, and we want to come before God with a heart of wisdom. And so he says, teach us, Lord. Teach us to number our days. Notice with me here that this passage, when it mentions these 70 years, he says, As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Average life expectancy in the United States of America. Do you want to take a guess? 78.1. 78.1. And there are some countries over in Europe where it's actually a little bit higher, like 80 years. And it's interesting, but it's all due to strength, according to this passage of Scripture. This passage of Scripture says that that it's not uncommon. The days of our life might be 70 years long. And if your reason by strength is that you're able to live another 10 years, that's not that unusual. We have good medicine. We have all kinds of uh, things that are written uh, about health. Uh, It goes on and on and on, doesn't it? And so by virtue of strength, we might be able to live a little bit longer. Over in the book of Proverbs, which uh, here follows Psalms, in chapter 3, it says, Here, my son, do not forget my teaching, Psalm, or Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. But let your heart, he says, keep my commandments. Why is it important to keep God's commandments? Well, there's a number of reasons that it's important to keep God's commandments. But he says, here's a byproduct of keeping God's commandments. He says, for length of days and years of life, and peace they will add to you. So by keeping the commandments of God, we can possibly add length and days to our life. But that's not always the case, is it? It's not always the case. The preacher that I was listening to this morning as I drove into church was amazing to me this day because he was talking about prolonging our days. And he talked about the whole exercise craze. And the interesting thing is he'd read the books and he was out running and, and so he's a, a regular you know, runner and he's trying to make sure. He says, I read all these books about your health and so forth. And he says, I, I, I read that if I go out there and I run and I eat right, I, I won't die of a heart attack. And I thought, wow. As I'm listening to an old tape of this preacher, I'm reminded that he didn't die of a heart attack, but he died very young as uh, from cancer. Teach us, Lord. 
Teach us to number our days. You see, with God, there's no mistakes. God knows our beginning. God knows our end. And it's important for us to stop and to think. Well, I got thinking about this whole thing with 70 years. And I got thinking about it from the standpoint of, of what does that really look like? with regard to time. And I thought, you know, it, it's good to be able to take a, a little, uh, a, one of those countdown meters. Do you see the seconds going by at the bottom? Well, there's 4,102 days. And that comes out to 98,462 hours. And so forth, the minutes, and so forth, the seconds. It's actually 11 years and two months. So in 11 years and two months, you say, well, what's this a countdown to, Pastor Kevin? It's a countdown to the day I turn 70. I looked at that and I thought, wow, I have 11 years according to Psalm chapter 90. Maybe by measure of strength, there'll be more, but maybe not. Maybe there'll be even less. And I stopped to think about that, 11 years, 11 Christmases, 11 Fourth of Julys, 11 more birthdays, celebrating birthdays with my wife, my kids, and so forth as the opportunity happens. 11 more starts to baseball season. 11 more Super Bowls, that's it. It's over. I got thinking about time. And I thought how sobering it is to watch those seconds click off. And once they're off, they're gone forever. The psalmist writes and he says, Lord, teach us. Teach us to number our days so that when we see you, we might present to you a heart of wisdom. Well, enough looking at that screen. It's so positive and encouraging. <laughs> My grandmother lived to be 100. I was thinking of that as well. I thought, wow, that's too many years. That's 42 more years of all of that. That's a long, long time. Well, we don't know, do we? None of us know, and uh, we don't know how long it, uh, it may go. But the one thing that's so important is that we would take note of our time. Because time is a resource. Time is also a tyrant can truly be a tyrant. Take your Bibles and go back to Mark chapter 6 with me. I want to show you a passage uh, that deals with Jesus as he interacts with the 12 disciples. And uh, I, I find these disciples fairly fascinating in, in many ways. But I, as I think about time, I think of, of how time can really be a tyrant. We live our lives. We, we are oftentimes looking at the clock. This morning I'm looking at that, those huge green numerals that are up there in the back of the church. Tells me it's 940 and it tells me I've you know starting to, to wind down here you know as far as time goes when I come to Mark chapter 6 I see how difficult it can be to to balance life we have the 12 disciples in chapter 6 and verse 7 being sent out and Jesus says here and he summoned the 12 and began to send them out in pairs and he gave them authority over the unclean spirits he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he said, do not put on two tunics. He said, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. They went out, the Bible says, and preached that men should repent. They were casting out many demons. They were anointing with oil many sick people, and they were healing them. So this is a, a vibrant ministry that these six couples have as they go forward to send out the gospel of Jesus Christ. What an exciting time that must have been. During this passage of scripture, we find that King Herod is going to take the head of John the baptizer. And it's at the end of that passage in verse 29, the disciples heard about this. They came and they took away his body and they put it in a tomb, the Bible says. Now, right after that, according to this passage, the apostles gathered together with Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. It doesn't really come 
jumping out of you from the English text here. But in the Greek, when he talks about this report that came to Jesus, they were telling Jesus about how much work they had done. The original Greek word is how we would translate it, how much. Literally, they were saying to Jesus, this is how much we did. This is how much we taught. This is how busy we were. This is what we accomplished. It became all about them. It became all about their focus and what they were seeking to do. And Jesus doesn't praise them for all of the work that he does. It's very interesting here in verse 31. Jesus' reply to them is, come away by yourselves to a secluded place. Let's rest a while. The principle of, of rest uh, is one day in seven. God creates that principle all the way back in Genesis chapter one where he is working in the creation, uh, creating all things for six days. And then on the seventh day, the Bible says he rested. Later on, that same pattern is seen with the people of Israel as the Sabbath is eventually instituted and you have one day of rest, that being a Saturday, um, the last day of the week. And so you had six days you worked, and the seventh day you rested. This was common, and this principle is a principle that I believe should not be violated even today. Jesus sees the merit of this rest aspect. He doesn't focus on how much, but it seems like that's where their focus is. They're excited, no doubt. They've saw, seen the Lord work. I think a lot of that is harmless, and I think that a lot of that is commendable on their part. But it just seems to jump off the page and give us the idea that they were busy about so many things, and they wanted to share with Jesus just how much they'd done. You see, the problem is, in our society today, being busy is really viewed as a measure of success, isn't it? Being busy is, you're, you're kind of successful. I came across an article that, that laid these things out that I thought were very true, and I just wanted to repeat them for us today. People today oftentimes stay too busy because of, number one, our egos. Our egos. We want to appear important. Uh, we're, in, we're in such demand that we must be successful. So we tend to overload our schedules. There are people that want to appear important. You remember how it was when this was transitioning? Those of you who are a little bit more towards evening? Do you remember when this was transitioning? I remember when, when Palm Pilots came out, right? And I remember when, when people had Blackberries and they were like super busy and super important. And I remember some of the old days. I remember the old days when, when people would get up in the morning and, and uh, you know, old down on Cape Cod, it was kind of like if you got there, you got there, you know. They'd tell you, You're, we're going to come. I remember when we built our house on Cape Cod as a kid, I remember my dad saying, they'll tell you they're going to be there today. It means they're going to be there within two weeks because they were just kind of laid back. You know, you kind of get up and you just kind of, you know, you know, it's too nice of a day. I think I'm going clamming. And, and, and things just were that way. I mean, it was just a different way of life. And as technology increased and, and people began to become uh, more driven towards material things, you could see that the, the egos became enormous. And it all became about how busy you are. I remember being at a pastor's conference. I've never been so turned off at a pastor's conference uh, than this one year that I was listening to this pastor preach. And at the end, he said, closed up his Bible. He said, well, he said, you know, I'd love to be able to hang around and fellowship with you guys, but I am so busy. He says, I've got to get to the airport and get flying off to my next speaking engagement. And he kind of looked down his nose, we felt like, at us, thinking, well, you guys don't have anything to do. You're standing around singing, you know, uh, how great thou art, and it is well with my soul, and the auditorium there is not air-conditioned. It must be 110 degrees. We're blowing these big fans, you know. The food is just marginal, but the fellowship is awesome, and the preaching of the word was great. He didn't have time. And so off he jetted to some other place. I remember thinking to myself, that really turns me off, and I really feel sorry for him. He just is so busy, and he wanted to make sure that he knew, or we all knew, how busy he was. Like somehow, his ego was filling the room. 
The second thing in this list of notations was people stay busy oftentimes to cover up laziness. Running around all day doing lots of activity is often a way to put off doing the more difficult responsibilities of life. Have you ever seen the commercial for the insurance company where the couple says, you know, listen, somebody needs to call the insurance company? <laughs> and they start throwing stuff around and then they're, oh, I'm too busy, you know, I'm, I have to rake these leaves that are still in the tree, uh, you know, and they, they go on and on and it's just kind of humorous. But, you know, oftentimes uh, people will today stay very busy. How are you doing? I'm busy, I'm busy. I'm not doing what I ought to be doing and just kind of, but I'll let you know how busy I am. Oftentimes, busyness can also be due to greed, You're never satisfied. You wind up things tighter and tighter every year because you're driven to make more every year. People also stay busy because they're, they're more concerned about pleasing man than pleasing God. You know the folks that can't say no to anything because I wouldn't want you to think less of me because, and so I say yes and I try to do it. I believe that numbering our days, going back in our minds to Psalm chapter 90, really also means evaluating the quality of the time that we spend doing things. The amount of time we spend is often not as important as the quality of time that we spend. Not only do we have to consider where our time goes, but, but really how we spend it, how well do we spend it. It's, it's a quality investment. I can make sure that I read my Bible every day and I can read that one verse and say, well, that's done and move on. But how much quality is that? How much time do we actually stop to think about God himself? Well, the last point is that time is an investment. If you take your Bibles, go back over to Ephesians with me. Ephesians chapter five this is a passage that no doubt most of you probably have, have heard expounded on many times. In Ephesians chapter 5, it tells us here that there should be a focus about our life. In verse 15, Paul writes, he says, therefore, he says, be careful how you walk. Well, when he says how you walk, he's not talking to us literally about how we put one foot in front of the other. He's actually talking about our way of life. He says, be careful how you live life, not as unwise men. The word unwise there is the word where we get the word moron from. Don't be an unwise. Don't be a moron, he says. Be careful how you live your life. Live it as wise person. And how do you do that? If verse 16, making the most of your time. Because the days are evil. Well, King James is going to talk about redeeming the time walking circumspectly. I love some of those, uh, those old King James terms in this passage of Scripture. Walk circumspectly, not as fools. When I think of the word circumspectly, it means to be very diligent in how you live. I mean, it's to the point where you're strict about the way in which you live. It's, it's talking there about the disciplines of our Christian life. And he's saying that we should not be undisciplined. Walk circumspectly. Walk carefully. It's translated carefully in the New American Standard. But that word circumspectly, akabas, is a, an interesting word. It really talks about making a conscious choice about what we do and how we do it, how we live out our, our lives. The illustration was given in a commentary I read tens of years ago about a cat that walks along a white picket fence. How it picks its foot up and very carefully places the next foot down. And it's just very carefully going across that picket fence. That has stuck in my mind since whenever. And I thought, how great an illustration that truly is. That's how I'm supposed to live life. That's how I'm supposed to look at my days. That's how I'm supposed to, to stop and to consider, what are you doing? And so literally, he, when he says this, he says, therefore, be careful how you live life, not as, as, as a fool, not as an unwise man, but as wise making the most of 
your time. And when he says there, making the most of your time, it's, it's in the King James, it was redeeming the days. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. And literally making most of kind of misses the point here, but in literal translation here, it's, it's used, uh, this verb is used to buy back something. If you were to take something off the market, the idea here was, and it's used in a middle voice, it's to, to buy up for yourself. Buy up for yourself. You're, you're redeeming something. You're actually taking this time and you're going to exchange it for something that is worthwhile. So in the next hour, we all have the opportunity to spend the next hour doing different things. And how are we going to spend that? How are we going to take it? How are we going to exchange it? What are we going to exchange it for? That's a big decision, isn't it? It's a big decision. When I was a kid, we used to get S and H green stamps at A and P. A and P. You remember A and P, the grocery store, Atlantic Pacific. That's what it stood for, and you could get those green stamps. And so they'd look at your bill and they'd say, "Well, you spent sixty dollars today. That's a lot of money." And they'd wind it up with the little rotor thing, and out the stamps would come, and they'd hand you the stamps. And you'd go home, and you'd actually have books, and you'd take your stamps, and you'd you'd stick them in the books. That's what kids did. They didn't play Pokemon. They sat around the table with the green stamps. And they had a little book there that told you what you could someday redeem these things for. If you had 20 books, you could redeem it and you could get yourself a fan. Whoo! So you were very careful. Do you want something small or do you want to keep gathering these things up and then redeeming them for something precious? So you could buy back for yourself with those green stamps something that was quite valuable. I remember we got a green hassock. What a waste of green stamps. There were all kinds of fine toys that I could have amused myself with, and this green hammock was just a little thing. It wasn't even very big at all. I wondered what in the world my parents were thinking. Besides, the green was terrible looking. It's that pea green, ugh. You have to be careful how you buy back. You see, that's what Paul is trying to say. Don't, don't be as an unwise person. Don't, don't be as one whose who's mental processes aren't clicking. It would be foolish for you to trade that in and get something that wasn't worthwhile. And so in the next hour, in the next day, you're going to make choices on how you're going to exchange the time that God has given to you as a resource and how you're going to use it. We need to be careful with that because we only have so much time. Some of you are here today and you're incredibly busy. You're so busy, there really isn't much time for much. The different stages of life are interesting. We go through life as single people. We have more time than a lot of times we know what to do with. We're up for all kinds of stuff whenever. We get married and have children, and these children take up so much time. They don't know how to feed themselves. They don't know how to bathe themselves. They can't change their own diapers. It's just amazing, and, and life just becomes all-consuming, and the next thing you know, they're, they're engaged in activities, and you're running here, and you're running there, and you can't wait for them to get their own driver's license, and you hand them a car because you just are so tired of driving them everywhere. They think you're being nice. Teach us to number our days. We go through these seasons of life where there's busyness, and you may be sitting there thinking to yourself, I can't wait till I retire so I don't have to number my days anymore. Do you know? He doesn't say, teach us to number our days only when we're young or only when we're busy. He says, number our days right to the end. How are you going to use your life for God's glory all the way to the very end? Jonathan Edwards, great preacher, wrote down in his 20s resolutions that he would live by. His life didn't go all that long. He was only 54 years old when he received a smallpox vaccination that killed him. But resolution number five on his list of resolutions that he wrote in his 20s, resolution five was resolved, never to lose one moment of time, but improve it the most profitable way I possibly can. Resolution six, resolved. To live with all my might, 
while I do live. Resolution 17, resolved that I will live so as I shall wish I had done when I come to die. May the Lord give us wisdom as we live these days. May we truly ask God to teach us to number our days. Would you pray with me? As we take a moment to bow our hearts before the Lord, you may be here this morning and God may be speaking to your heart today about your eternity. God who is everlasting, God who is eternal, has created us as eternal beings. In other words, our soul will live forever. The body will die, but the soul will live on. And your relationship with Christ will determine where that takes place. Have you placed your faith in Jesus and him alone? Let me urge you today, if you've never spent a moment of time in prayer before the Lord and called on his name for salvation to do that right now. And perhaps you're here as a, as a follower of Christ. I wonder today if your heart's been challenged about time. Take a moment to look at your own heart and life and ask, am I managing it well? May God teach us all to number our days. Father, we thank you and praise you that you're willing, Lord, to show us the importance of the resource of time. Help us, Lord, to have in our hearts the same resolve that this pastor had years and years ago, redeeming the time. Because, Lord, we know that the days are evil. And Father, there is much for us to do. Help us, Lord, to live effectively for you. Help us, Lord, to take time. Maybe it's time to just get away from it all and to seek your face. Help us, Lord, not to be ashamed in the world in which we live that is so motivated by success to take a step back and spend time with you. Lord, help us not to become slaves to the tyrant of time. But help us, Lord, to use it for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read here the words of the Apostle Paul who draws us to the Lord's Supper. And Paul says in verse 23, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup and sup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This morning we declare our faith in Christ. We declare that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ as our savior. I love it here when he says, do this in remembrance of me. How much time do we spend remembering what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross? How often we take it for granted and we just roll on. Let's just pause by bowing our heads and using this time to remember what God has done in our life. 
The communion elements, the bread and the cup representing the body and blood of Christ are for everyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you're not certain of your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I would hold off from taking this because of the warning in this passage that tells us to be careful. This is uniquely for the body of Christ. I'm gonna ask Pastor Steve to pray and ask the blessing on the bread that represents the body of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift that you gave us when you gave your life on the cross, your body, Lord, that was broken for us that we might have a hope of eternal life. Lord, as we pause to remember that sacrifice, may we rededicate anew, Lord, our lives to you and that we might do everything in our power to reflect the glory that you have given us, Lord, back to those around us, that they can see you in us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and amen.